Hello, Keith Kaiser here again with another lesson from God's Holy Word. We're in the Mount of Olives Discourse, the Olivet Discourse as it's called, the Sermon on the Mount of Olives if you prefer. And our Lord is talking about His coming in glory, His second coming to earth. Not to be confused with the rapture, which is His coming in the air to receive the church to Himself. But His second coming to earth, and it's going to be where He delivers the remnant of Israel that he has saved at that time, and also where he saves and ushers into the kingdom those who have identified with the God of Israel, those who've been kind to the, to the Jews and who are looking for the coming of Messiah, the Son of Man. And so they have shown this by how they treated his people in that time. Now, look at verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, this is Matthew twenty five thirty seven. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, and naked or clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So this is not mere philanthropy. This is not solely doing good to our fellow man or helping the less fortunate. We hear that kind of phraseology all the time. This is something specific. Did you identify with the suffering people of Messiah and say, hey, how these people are being treated, their persecution is unjust. And I believe in their Messiah, in their devotion, their willingness to lose the goods of this world, their willingness to go out hungry and thirsty because they're being persecuted, their willingness to be have their health jeopardized and to be imprisoned. That shows me the reality of their faith and that God is real. I believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and God who will rule over this world as King of kings and Lord of lords. And I, because I believe that, I'm going to help these people where I can. I'm going to visit them in prison or give them some food or clothe them or give them the needs that they have. Now, again, we have more general teaching in the Bible on our duty to take care of the poor and help the orphan and the widow and the stranger, these different kinds of people. So that's been part of Israel's history in the Old Testament. That's been part of the church in the current age from day one, as it were. So we're not discounting the value of that. And Christians have always been busy in establishing in the Middle Ages, for example, hospitals. And uh, even to this day are involved in hospital work around the world or medical work around the world. And there are many medical missionaries in foreign countries where there isn't much decent medical care. And I have personal friends that are involved in that kind of work on different continents. So that goes on and that's a good thing that is done in the name of christ and it's a commercial really for the lord's kindness that god cares about people that he doesn't just uh, remain indifferent shall we say to people's suffering but in ministering to people's bodies we have to always remember there's also the spirit and the soul and that's really the thing that we have to make sure is the person right with the lord jesus christ have they believed in the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Have they repented, that is, seen themselves as a sinner before God, justly condemned, deserving hell, under judgment, and they're headed down that wrong way that leads to destruction, and now they want to turn from that, turn from themselves, from their own wisdom and understanding, and believe the Word of God, put their faith in the man whom the Word of God holds forth as the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And of course, he's not merely a man, not only a man, but he's God manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. So we point people to the Savior. Now, to get a hearing for that, and because we care about people, because the Lord tells us to love our neighbor as ourself, of course, we want to be concerned about their physical needs and involved in ministry where we can be and support ministries that go on to help all kinds of people. But I tell you, in the tribulation, it's going to be the norm that believers are chased out, that believers 
are hiding, that believers are in caves somewhere or in the woods or in jungles or in remote places trying to escape persecution and even in cities. I mean, the underground church exists today in various parts of the world, in countries where believers don't have religious freedom and don't have liberty and are persecuted. There's already a vigorous underground church, and that's going to expand and multiply and be much stronger in the tribulation. The church will be taken out of here by the rapture, of course, but the believers that trust in the Lord Jesus and become the remnant of Israel that the Old Testament prophets prophesied about, they're going to be hunted and harried and pursued uh, in the animosity of unbelievers. So when the Lord's talking about the sheep ministering to these people, he's talking about specific work to aid the persecuted. But of course, the flip side is that there will be people that won't aid the persecuted people, not just because they're apathetic or indifferent to the plight of those suffering around them, but they're taking a stance against Jesus. They're saying, we don't think there's any substance to his claims. We don't believe he's the God of this world. <laughs> they're going to follow Satan as the God of this world. They won't knowingly do it, perhaps, at least not at the beginning. But those, for example, in the tribulation who take the mark of the beast, as Revelation 13 uh, will indicate, they're worshiping the beast. They're saying, who is like the beast? Here is this incomparable, unique one, and we're looking to him to give us food and give us security. And they're going to say to people, peace and safety, as 1 Thessalonians 5 says. Well, uh, the Bible makes it clear. People that follow him are going to be blinded. They're going to be deluded. And because they receive not the love of the truth, they will be sent a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie, the lie that this man of sin, Second Thessalonians 2 calls him, who is the son of perdition, really, who characterizes the epitome of what it means to be lost. This is the one who is an embodiment of perdition. He really is like evil incarnate, you know, a life that is against God, that is truly antichrist and a counterfeit Christ as well, a substitute for the true Messiah. That's what this man's going to be. And people are going to follow him to their spiritual destruction because they didn't want the truth. And because you, they don't want the truth, they're going to be turned to a lie. They're going to believe, even though that belief is going to lead them to the height of folly. Well, such is the hubris of man. But really, it plays out in practical terms that uh, Jesus says here, our Lord says, that you did not give me the things that I needed. He says here, depart from me, you cursed, in verse 41, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now think of that. The kingdom wasn't prepared for the sheep. Originally, the kingdom was prepared for the Lord. But the Lord, in his grace, says it's the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. God always had it in his plan, in other words, to save and bless the people that receive the Lord Jesus Christ. But for those who reject him, what do they get? They get cursing. They get the everlasting fire which was prepared for the devil and his angels, his messengers or emissaries, those who have rebelled with him, formerly angels created by God, but now living in rebellion as the devil is, and they're going to get judgment. That's their destiny. They can't avoid that. The Bible tells us over and over that they're going to go to hell and then be cast in, or rather be, go to the lake of fire, I should say. And they're going to be cast into that everlasting fire. And it's not going to end. It's going to be eternal conscious punishment. The Lord described it in the Gospel of Mark as where the flame is not quenched and where the worm does not die. And of course, he's quoting from the Old Testament when he says that. But in any case, uh, this just shows that the battle lines are drawn. And this is quite a simple thing. Are you for Christ or against him? And First John puts it in those simple terms in chapter 5. He that has the Son has life. 
He that has not the Son has not life. I mean, it's as simple as that. Salvation rests in Christ. And if you have a living relationship with Christ, you've received him by faith as your Lord and Savior and therefore been born again. You've received the gift of eternal life. The Lord said, Assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. So it's a certainty for those who've believed on the Lord Jesus that they will be saved. That as uh, 1 Thessalonians tells us in chapter 5, that God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And also 1 Thessalonians 1.10 tells us that he's the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. So if you have the Lord Jesus, you're not fearing eternal fire and judgment. You can say, as Romans 8, 1 says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's not based on us being nice people or us being better than other people or our performance. Because Christians, if they're truly believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, someone calling themselves a Christian ought to be the first to recognize, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm someone who deserved judgment, but God in grace has given me eternal life because of the Lord Jesus, because of who he is and what he's done. His death on the cross was for my sin. His resurrection was to give me eternal life as well as to prove that he was the son of God. And so I'm going to be with him. Just as he rose from the dead, we will be raised. Our bodies will be transformed and will forever be with the Lord. And even these folks in the tribulation that trust in the Lord and have to suffer so much for it to the point of being ill-clad and thirsty and hungry and not free and in prison and sick and so forth. They suffer much in the body here, but in their spirit and soul, they'll be able to have the unfading joy of knowing that the Holy Spirit lives within them and that the Lord Jesus says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, and that he's going to come again and raise them incorruptible. But Many will have to die in the tribulation for their faith in the Lord. Now, at this judgment, the Lord is going to be able to discern between the sheep and the goats. And there's going to be proof adduced. The proof is not just that God knows the hearts and minds of all men. That, of course, is true. But it's what they did with his people. That indicates what they think of the Lord Jesus. So if you love the Lord Jesus, you're going to love his people. You'll love the church in this age. If you... Uh, love the Lord, you'll love your brethren. And that's what First John says. That's one of the marks of life, that you love the brethren. You love brothers and sisters in Christ. doesn't matter what their ethnicity is. It doesn't matter uh, their background or their socioeconomic level or what country they come from. You meet another believer in Christ, man, you say they're family. You know, they're my brother. They're my sister. And it's all about the Lord. We know the Lord and even though we may not agree on other things in life, or we may even have some different understandings of uh, certain doctrines or certain things in Scripture, but if a person truly is born again by faith in Christ, we have that fundamental bond, don't we, of family, and we love one another. And we may say, well, the Lord's going to help us understand we trust as we grow and mature. We'll know his word better, and someday when we're with him, we're going to understand better still. Uh, but in the meantime, I love you for the Lord Jesus' sake. In the meantime, I want to help you in whatever way I can. And that will be the instinct of those who respond to the gospel in the tribulation age. Now, this is not salvation based on works. This is not these people by their charity have earned uh, the right to enter into the kingdom or these people, by their lack of charity, have uh, earned somehow eternal punishment. No, the thing that will damn you to hell is unbelief, not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the thing that will save you, of course, is the same thing, the opposite. It will be belief in Christ which saves you. And it's the same in every dispensation, and the tribulation will be no different, that salvation is by believing in God's word, the revelation that he's made 
of who he is and what he's done to save us. And the Old Testament saints didn't have all the data. They didn't know when Messiah would come. But they knew they were going to be saved by Messiah. And they knew that it was going to entail Messiah suffering and dying. And a sacrifice being offered. And we in the New Testament know that Messiah is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know he offered that sacrifice on the cross. And that he's risen again so that we can have eternal life. So it's not performance based. But our performance is going to demonstrate where our heart is. Do we know the Lord? Uh, well, then we're going to be concerned about his people. If we don't know the Lord, we're not going to care about his people. We're going to say, yeah, they're getting what they deserve. And that's what people are going to think in the tribulation who don't believe. I'm siding with Antichrist, they'll say, or the beast, or whatever name he'll have. I'm siding with that. That's the future here. That's paradise on earth for us. And in doing so, they're going to reject Christ and reject his people. But the Lord's going to come and bring about a judgment. So again, in every age, the decision has to be made. Am I going to receive the Lord or am I going to reject the Lord? There's really no middle way. Am I going to receive the light he gives? Am I going to believe the gospel or am I going to reject it? And unfortunately, many people in that age will reject the Lord and be cast into everlasting punishment. The same way that many people are making that cardinal mistake today. But also, many will believe. And I hope you're among that group. I hope uh, that you'll come to Christ. I pray that you will. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. That's what Acts 16.31 tells us. So, if you've never done so, may you say, Lord, I'm the sinner. And yet I'm putting my trust in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. The one who died on the cross and rose again to give me eternal life. And may you indeed come to know him as your Lord and Savior. Thank you for listening.